Most of our communities have been economic deserts. Historically, people of color had no choice but to have their own businesses in their communities. We need everybody working together to create a livable, workable environment. As we prepare to celebrate Black History Month, we look at the economic power of black-owned businesses in our local communities. We'll meet a nonprofit removing barriers for a new generation of entrepreneurs in South Florida's most historic African-American community. That and more, stay with us as we dive into your South Florida. Hello and welcome, I'm Pam Gigante. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to your South Florida where we choose one important topic each month that's having an impact on our local communities. We dive deep into that issue and take a look at it from several angles. This month, we are looking at the far reaching impacts of black owned businesses. While funding is often a challenge for entrepreneurs, for many African American and minority business owners, it can feel like the odds are stacked against them. According to a U.S. Commerce Department study, minority entrepreneurs are more likely to be denied loans, pay higher interest rates, and many may not even bother applying at all for those loans because of the fear of rejection. But with the rise of the Buy Black movement and the growing buying power of African Americans expected to reach $1.5 trillion by next year, there's tremendous economic opportunity for black businesses and local communities. Here to share more about overcoming these barriers and the power of black business is Dr. J. Preston Jones, Dean of Florida Memorial University's School of Business. Dr. Jones, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you. I'm happy to be here, Pam. So let's talk a little bit about what we heard that man say in the introduction about these economic deserts in African-American communities. Talk about that. Well, I was thankful for that segment that I heard. It reminded me of my childhood. I grew up in uh, Gary, Indiana and in, in Chicago and lived in a neighborhood that was uh, dominated by project housing and we were poor. Uh, most of us were. We were uh, the families were steel workers and, and laborers. But one thing that I do remember is the businesses that supported the community that, and they were businesses that we would um, uh, that we would, uh, you know, depend upon. Sure, and patronize. As and patronize, absolutely. People of that community. Absolutely. But one thing I do know is that the owners of those businesses had one thing in mind, that they would solve the problems that were present at that time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really what we have to, to think about now as we look forward. What problems are the young entrepreneurs looking for? To solve. Sure, and talk about that because you're in higher education. You're the dean of the School of Business at Florida Memorial University. What's the approach there in teaching these up and coming and vibrant and excited students with great ideas about how to be an entrepreneur in today's society, in today's economic world, but also giving back to their communities where they came from? Right. Well, first and most important is uh, do you remember when you were asked? A question what do you want to be when you grow up yeah. and what was the answer I don't know yeah, yeah, yeah. what I ask the students today is what problems do you want to solve mm. and then you base your goals upon that and if it's to start a new business then that's but it has to be surrounded by what problems you're going to solve yeah. and with that then we began to help them to learn the skills that they're going to need to do so sounds like when you ask them what problems are you going to solve you're forcing them to think critically and to have a plan and a vision correct well that's what bill gates did mm -hmm. that's what stephen jobs any successful entrepreneur whether you start uh quickbooks or whether it's google they're solving a problem uber solved the problem sure. yeah it wasn't a me too business but it, they solved the problem they were disruptors and helped to correct. solve a problem what do you think are some of the biggest challenges and as i mentioned in the intro for many minority groups and African Americans, trying to get the funding to start a business is something that's really difficult. So talk about some of those barriers and maybe challenges, especially that maybe people in the black community have. Well, the challenges have been documented. Access to capital 
is really, really important. Uh, you know, cash is king and cash flow is even more important. But I would say that the, there are several uh, obstacles to overcome. The first is with the entrepreneur herself or himself. And I'm reminded to uh, share with you what I share with the students is that business is a game. You keep score with money. Mm. Bill Gates has said it. Uh, J. Paul Getty, uh, 100 years ago, said it. And even our president. And you have to love the game. And so when you're going into business, you don't expect that someone's going to give you an advantage to win in this game. Mm. As soon as you declare that you're going to start a business, you have, co you have competition, mm. you see. And then the banks want to be paid. Sure. And so the plan is to understand that and to uh, develop a plan to overcome those obstacles. And with that, you need to have uh, people that you can, that can mentor you, mm -hmm. uh, uh, bankers, mm -hmm. lawyers, other successful people mm -hmm. to help you to, to uh, change the game for yourself. Talk about how FMU is working to help their students with those sorts of things because there's the education piece of it but like you're saying you need the mentors mm -hmm. and you need the business people you need community partnerships frankly right. right because you can't do it on your own you need an ecosystem around you to help lift you up correct and the way to do that uh, is to engage the students in an entrepreneurship environment from the very beginning uh, our mascot is the lion mm. And you've heard of Shark Tank, and I remind my students that, you know, sharks cannot survive in the Serengeti, but that's where <laughs> lions live. So the name of our innovation center will be the Serengeti. And the students will be required to start a business, to go through that process, and to, under the guidance of faculty and other uh, business owners, to go th through that process while they are at the university. And hopefully, uh, you, you never know what... Uh, what business, uh, great opportunities that they're going to build. Yeah. Dr. Jones, thank you so much. It was lovely meeting you. And best of luck with everything you're doing with your program at FMU. We're going to check back in with you periodically and see how you all are doing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, Pam. And we'll have more information for you about Florida Memorial University on our Facebook page at your South FL. Well, the historic city of Overtown was once the heartbeat of African-American business, culture, and entertainment in Miami. And now a local nonprofit is working to revive this community's economic engine once again through business development. Its focus is helping young, uh, young entrepreneurs build business and community all at the same time. We came together to start an organization that was purposed on trying to strengthen the nonprofit sector uh, here in Miami. At the same time, we have always been interested in economic development. There was a lot of opportunity because most of our communities have been economic deserts. And most of the people, even if you wanted to, for instance, go to a gas station, you had to go outside the community. If you needed a cleaners, you had to go outside of the community. What we're trying to do is uh, create a viable community. That's a community where people can live, work, and play. We started to promote entrepreneurship in disadvantaged neighborhoods like Overtown and Liberty City. It's taken on a different kind of feel to it because Overtown, like many of the uh, redeveloping urban communities in this country, is actually becoming a, a really a hot spot, a hot urban place and a hot urban destination. So it's not a stretch that people want to come in and uh, open up their businesses in some place like Overtown or Liberty City. The younger generation is sort of defining their own spaces. They're coming to places like Overtown and other places to tap into the authenticity that they feel that by being a part of these communities. And so what has to happen is, is that entrepreneurs have to actually cater to that kind of thing and they have to know, you know what to do and they have to establish a vibe that is consistent with the vibe of the community. We noticed that the entrepreneur spirit has always been there, but it's now even more like, I'm here. And so more and more people are wanting to have conversations about how to get involved with businesses. So many folks have had ideas for the longest, but really have never had anyone to bounce the ideas off of. By us being in the neighborhood, we make ourselves accessible for those conversations. We've had a transition period where the millennials today have 
witnessed a lot of the problems and, and, and challenges that their parents or grandparents have faced. And so now there's this surgence of where folks are coming in saying, okay, well, how can I be a part of the solution and not necessarily the problem? You know, so folks are moving back to their neighborhoods. Folks are getting involved and taking their time, talent and resources from maybe their corporate jobs and bringing that back to the level of the community that, that they are now participating in. One of the things that I do believe that millennials like is the sense of corporate responsibility, where they feel that the organization or the company that they're buying from cares about them, that cares about the communities. Historically, people of color had no choice but to have their own businesses in their communities because other races were not coming into the community to open up a doctor's office, a hairdresser, a pharmacy. Now. I believe that millennials are being a lot more intentional about supporting their own. There is a very much so support black business or buy black movement because we understand the power of our dollar. We spend the most out of any culture, any race, we spend. And if we were to spend with our own, our businesses would be able to do better. It gives them a sense of belonging and purpose for their community. Most of our programs are designed to attract people who have already indicated that they want to start businesses in uh, Overtown. We accept only those people who uh, intend to stay in the community, who have actively looked for space in the community and um, have, a, have a business that uh, you know, really fits the community. So we have a program, for instance, that's called a boot camp program. And that boot camp program teaches back office skills, marketing, how to price your product, how to access your customers to would-be entrepreneurs that are from and uh, intend to continue to be in the community. We want to remove all of the things that will stop people from coming through our doors and getting the help that they truly need. And so we, we got rid of the, the credit, credit score requirements. We got rid of the, the background checks. We got rid of all of the things that would typically keep someone from wanting to start a business. And so someone's willing to give us 12 to 16 weeks of their time to properly construct their business plan, lay out how they plan on you know, attacking the market and seeing where the loopholes are for them and the gaps and where they can take advantage of and become the experts in that space. We feel it's best that we do our part in assisting with that. One of the biggest hurdles is the access to the capital. And so many entrepreneurs, in particular communities like Overtown and Liberty City, will tell you that they got this idea to do a business, but they can't get access to the dollars. And so we've picked up the slack with our community partners to say, let us get you ready to go down that traditional pathway to get access to capital. But in the meantime, we'll front the money will become the micro lender to get your business off the ground. It's a, it's a wonderful pleasure to see those businesses take off the way that they have, just with, some, with a little bit of capital. Pitch Night is where we take the top participants that were enrolled in our business boot camp. We take the top business plans, we evaluate them. This is a grant, this is not a loan, this is nothing they have to pay back. We want to invest in that business and we give them an opportunity to pitch their businesses to the audience and the judges that are there. Social Exchange and Alexis Brown won our very first inaugural pitch night of $10,000. Social Exchange started because I saw a need for a place for people of color to be able to let their hair down and have a good time and to have that nucleus and that sense of community around nightlife and entertainment and networking. I was running into roadblocks where I was not able to find venues that honestly did not want an African-American crowd, or they were busy and they didn't want my business. So I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges as not only just a minority business owner, a black business owner, but a black woman business owner um, working in nightlife, which is a very male-dominated industry. But I use it to my advantage because it allows for people to experience someone different. And if I can work with them, or even if I meet with them and they decide not to work with me, that their interpretation or their opinion of my culture, of women, is a little bit different, or a little bit more positive. I've worked along with Urban Philanthropies on a variety of things, particularly one of my newest projects, which is Black Pepper. It's a black restaurant food festival, which is actually taking place at um, their venue site in Overtown. It's about 58,000 square feet space located in the heart of the historic Overtown community. This land is where, where the entertainers who couldn't stay on the beach side will come back over town, literally over town. 
Since then, you know, being known as the Harlem of the South, kind of gotten away from that. And so the space called Urban kind of brings back that culture, brings back the craft of food, and brings back the experience of entertainment. And it does something very intangible for this neighborhood. It gives them hope. You got to think about what hope does to uh, a group of people who have been marginalized, who've been disinvested in, who's been disenfranchised. It makes life just a tad bit easier to know that your community is being highlighted for the culture that they themselves have embodied this whole time. I think it's extremely important that whatever any organization does be seen as part of an overall strategy and network of organizations because there's not one organization, there's not one governmental entity that can lift a community in the way that it needs to be lifted. There are issues of housing, there's issues of education, there's issues of crime, and we need everybody working together to create a livable, workable environment. Well, a recent study by Digital Undivided, an incubator for minority female entrepreneurs, shows that while black women are the fastest growing segment of U.S. business owners, they're still the least likely to receive investments. As a successful business owner herself, our next guest is helping these women and other future business leaders and owners get a head start. Here to share more is Annette Gray, founder and CEO of the Global Business Development Center Entrepreneurship Institute. So nice to have you with us. How Good are morning. you? Good morning. It's a mouthful. It right? is a mouthful, but there's a lot to say because you're doing such great work. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And a congratulations because you were in 2018 Nonprofit of the Year by the Palm Beach Chamber, Black Chamber of Commerce, right? Yes. That's yes, exciting. Yes. So it says a lot about the work you're doing. Very honored. Very honored. Yeah. So yeah. tell us a little bit about your organization. GBDC Entrepreneurship Institute truly uh, was and is a labor of love. Mm. And it focuses around the challenges that I experienced uh, in my entrepreneurship career. So, you know, every day I strive, I, we say we work with entrepreneurs from nine to 99, and mm -hmm. it really is true. Yeah. <laughs> Our youngest <laughs> entrepreneur is nine years old. Oh my gosh. Um, but there's been, I've been an entrepreneur for 21 years, thereabouts, and all of the challenges that I've fla faced, I have attempted to address with this organization. Uh, so we work with young entrepreneurs around entrepreneurial education. We don't necessarily focus on the opening of the enterprise. Yeah. We focus on entrepreneurial education and the transferable skills. So we don't think that every nine-year-old is going to become a business owner. Sure. But what we do know is they will become better community leaders. They will be become better communicators, leaders, sure. uh, negotiators, mm -hmm. because all of those skills are life skills that are transferable. Sure. So through our Kidpreneur Leadership Academy, our young people start and manage their own city. They learn how the integral parts of a city work together. And they also learn career development and leadership development. But most importantly, they get the exposure outside of their community so that they can in the future feel more comfortable in environments that's beyond their reach at this time. That's smart. So educational, especially at a young age. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Talk about some of the barriers that you help people overcome. Because we saw some of that in the piece from Urban Philanthropies. Mm -hmm. Some of the roadblocks sometimes that minorities and people in the uh, African-American community face when they want to start a business. So what are some of those challenges that you help and mentor people through? Largely, I, I know everyone talks about funding and financing, but primarily it's your personal brand as an individual. Mm -hmm. That personal brand is something that if you start developing it early in your career, it's likely if someone came into you and you didn't know who they were, would you want to lend them money? Yeah, probably, probably not. Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me more about yourself. <laughs> exactly. Before I hand over so a big check. Managing your personal brand, becoming known for something, uh, and particularly something that you're passionate about, developing longevity, developing uh, resources and relationships. So we talk a lot about writing that business plan. Most of our adult entrepreneurs are transitioning from careers. We focus a lot on that transition period. Yeah. And we're very intentional in developing the, the brand, 
very intentional in looking at the marketplace because a lot of people start businesses that they're passionate about and that passion is wonderful. Sure. I focus on the passion of making money and yeah. being profitable. And being sustainable, right? Absolutely. Right. And going into non-traditional industries. Mm. There are a lot of competition. Give us, give us an example. Non-traditional, and, and the, the previous guest talked about Uber. Yeah. Like look at the marketplace mm -hmm. and look at what challenges need, what problems need to be solved. So industries, for example, I'm a commercial real estate broker. I don't know of many brokerage uh, in commercial real estate that is owned by an African-American female. I'm not saying that they're not out there, but I started my, redevelop my, my commercial career in redevelopment. Mm -hmm. And 20 years ago, that was largely a very male populated industry. Now mm -hmm. there are a lot of female residential realtors, mm -hmm. right? Sure. Uh, but from the commercial brokerage standpoint. So take a look at the marketplace, cause, because competition is competition. Sure. So if, if the industry is 95% female, that is competition. Sure, right? so do your homework. Absolutely, do your yeah. homework, solve a problem. We talked a lot about not just going towards the traditional routes, but mm -hmm. looking at the marketplace mm -hmm. and doing your market research and solving a problem, developing your personal brand, and try not to be so traditional in your choices. So let's talk about something I know you're very proud of, your MELT bus, yes. and M-E-L-T stands for something. So walk us through <laughs> this really cool uh, endeavor that you were, you've been dreaming about and pushing for for many, many years, and it's finally come to fruition. Absolutely, yeah. it's a four-year labor of love. Yeah. You're starting to get that yeah. theme in the my theme, life, right? Yes. <laughs> um, in developing entrepreneurs, young and old, until South Florida, gets a little bit better at transportation. I know we're working at that. Sure. But that, one of the largest issues uh, with serving the community is access, mm -hmm. right? And so I needed to bring the programs to those who were challenged with transportation. So I worked with our local government municipality and transportation company, Palm Tran, and to gain access to a bus. We then gutted it, retrofitted it with computers. So it is mobile entrepreneurship leadership and training unit. And so we develop entrepreneurs. Same thing we do in our bricks and mortar office, but just making it a little bit more accessible to those who can't get out much. What I like too, is you said, it's also to help those who are homeless who want to start a business or, and they need to, they want to get a job frankly, and they kind of use the melt bus as like their home base, right, in a absolutely, way? Talk about absolutely, absolutely. So one of the challenges mm -hmm. in, in just job hunting is being able to have an email or a phone number yeah. or somewhere where a message center. So our new program going forward in 2020 is we will, those homeless, uh, the population who is actually seeking employment, we will design and give business cards with the melt bus, mm -hmm. their name, the melt bus, email, and phone number. And so they have, we're basically in incubating mm -hmm. around the job search process. So we're very excited about that program. That's lovely. Yeah. There's a movement too for African Americans to buy black. Mm. And you hear that, talk about that for a moment and why that's so important to the community and really just to everyone. Don't you think to be aware mm -hmm. of that these businesses are owned by African Americans mm -hmm. and to, to, to go and, and to shop there, and right? So talk about why buy black is so well, that, important. I think it's culturally, all other cultures support their own. Yeah. They're cheerleaders, they're financial supporters. And historically, however, in a lot of the black African American communities, the vendors were of different races. And and for whatever reason, maybe access to capital, family mm. support, and to have sustainability. Sure. Uh, and that has changed today. Today, uh, there are a diverse number of African-American businesses, uh, service and otherwise. And so, you know, we have to, and part of my soapbox, please don't let me get on it. <laughs> <laughs> but you're in the chair, you have, you have the floor. Yeah. Is really self-education about accessible resources mm -hmm. and support of each other. Mm -hmm. I think one of the important things is once the rest of the world see that we're capable of supporting each other, I think um, additional support will follow. And that's mm -hmm. a, the Buy Black movement, I think, is an integral part of that. And is there also a movement, and we heard it in the piece about urban philanthropies, is to take those businesses and make sure that they are 
inside some of the predominantly black communities, right? right? Don't start this business and then take it outside. Bring it back to the community where you came from so that we can continue to help each other and grow. Absolutely, and you know, I think I go back to knowing what resources are available. Right. I'm a former CRA commissioner, uh, Community Redevelopment sure. Agency, and there are a lot of economic development program that our um, constituents do not know about. Mm -hmm. It's marketing, is assistance with uh, rent, uh, your lease abatements, mm -hmm. uh, grants for facade developments. And so when you look into thriving communities, African American business owners really think from a financial standpoint they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So just, if you actually do get educated about the resource, get out and network beyond your comfort zone yeah. and find out there is actually a lot of programs out there that help. can help you keep yeah. the business in that community. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, organizations uh, like a CRA is designed to help you flourish yeah. within their community because they want to make a big community impact as well. Thank you, Annette. Thank you so much. It was great to have you with us. It was wonderful. I appreciate the support. Thank you. Absolutely. And we'll have more information for you about all of the programs and the organizations discussed on today's program on our Facebook page at Yourself FL. As always, thank you for joining us. We hope you'll join us again next time. We'll see you then.